as I mentioned, I I am well aware. This is a lot of information. I'm well aware of that. And uh, actually was a struggle as I was putting it all together, how to present it. But that's why, as I mentioned, if you're interested in this PowerPoint and it can be a help to you, maybe what I'll do is send it to Rob and he could dis disperse it for anyone who might want it. So we were looking at our seventh foundational point as we've moved into marriage, and that is that we need to be growing in a manifestation of the character of Christ. Now, I sort of have a philosophy on, on marriage and growing in marriage, and it is simply this. I think sometimes we study a subject like this and we run to all the verses that have husband and wife or marriage, and the fact of the matter is, there isn't that many. <laughs> but what there is in the Bible, and particularly the New Testament, is a plethora of, of verses teaching us as believers how to grow in the Lord. So if we're growing in the Lord, and this applies to every one of us, regardless if we're married, single, whatever our state of being is, we're growing in the Lord. So if we're in a married state, well, then, for instance, as we manifest the, the character of Christ, it's obviously good for us personally, but it can only help our marriage. Um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from in, in a topic like this. It isn't just trying to find all the verses on marriage, and it isn't necessarily a how-to, but rather what I'm trying to do is look at principles, principles that are timeless and don't change. And then we build upon the principles. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. That's how I'm sort of uh, approaching this study. So we were looking at these uh, character traits, <clears throat> which really is the character of Christ in Colossians 3, 12 through 14. We could look at the fruit of the spirit, similar type of things. All of them have to do with more of who we are than what we do. Because if God can, can fix who we are and cause us to grow in who we are, the behavior will take care of itself. As we become more like Christ, we will live more like Christ. We will speak more like Christ. We will think more like Christ. So we've been, I, I pulled the one out of here, and that is humility. Uh, we were looking at these several character traits from Colossians 3, but then we're pulling out the one of humility. And as I mentioned, this is just a kind of a personal thing. I like to think of it as the, the granddaddy of all of these character traits. Because humility, if we are truly humble, as the scripture points out, as the Lord Jesus demonstrated, well, that just that just has so many tentacles in life. It is just helpful in anything that we do. So we ended here. How are we doing in this area of humility? Maybe the Lord's working on us in this in some way, shape, or form. Maybe we struggle with pride. Um, maybe we're not as humble as we ought to be. But God certainly wants to work on that with us. But now let's bring it back, this particular character trait of humility, and let's bring that now within the context of marriage. And that's what we'll look at here on this next slide. How will this help? If I'm growing in humility, how will that help me in my marriage relationship? Number one, it enables me to see my personal abilities and inabilities in a balanced perspective. Romans 12 and verse 3 says, we are not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. I mean, that's a humbling verse, isn't it? <laughs> I think I'm great. I think I'm intelligent. I think I'm athletic. I think I'm, you know, we tend to put ourselves above other people. And how true in a marital relationship. If I think I'm smarter than my wife, which is a joke, or if I'm whatever, and we begin to, to, to live that way and think of each other that way, that is not healthy. But being humble, 
and the spirit of God working in our hearts and producing humility, it enables me to, maybe I am smarter than my wife, but then that doesn't become a point where I want to drive that home and I want to bring that up and I want to show that. And uh, obviously, you know, you can apply this to other relationships in life. But we're thinking of it here specifically in a marital context. Secondly, humility enables me to put my spouse first. Esteem others better than yourselves. I believe that's Colossians 2 and verse 3. I didn't put the reference here. Esteem others better than yourselves. Um, you know, if we're going to serve people, if we're going to serve one another in a marital relationship, <clears throat> yes, that is Philippians uh, 2 and verse 3. Let each esteem others better than himself. Again, we go back to the person of Christ. Why would he come to this world? Why would he offer himself? Why would he undergo all that he went for the likes of us? Can't we do that for one another? <laughs> Can't we do that for a husband? Can't we do that for our wives to put them first, to be self-sacrificing? Humility enables us to do that. Humility enables me to welcome advice from my spouse on many topics and problems. I have known many men have sat in their presence, and men that, that, that I admire and I enjoy and consider them friends, but some of them, when they talk to their wives, it's almost like they're talking down to them um, and really don't take advice well. <laughs> That's not healthy. That's not good. Again, this whole idea, and we'll get into this a little bit more when we look at the qualities of a, of a godly wife, this whole idea of being submissive does not mean the wife has nothing to contribute, nothing to say, no good ideas, and so on and so forth. That simply isn't what it's all about. But if I'm humble before the Lord, I'll welcome the advice of my wife. You know, she's going to see things in me or maybe some of my actions or how I'm doing things. I need that rebuke sometimes. And I'm glad it comes from my wife. Um, but humility enables us to take that and take it from the Lord. Fourthly, and this goes along with this, hum humility enables me to admit when I'm wrong. Whether we like to admit it or not, sometimes we are flat wrong <laughs> in our thinking and what we want to do and what we want to buy and where we want to go and a host of things. And we need to realize that to say that we're wrong, to realize we're wrong or we're, we're heading down a wrong path or we're, you know, there's things in life that are uh, coming in and they're, they're sapping our spiritual strength. You know, Paul says of Demas, he forsook him having committed some great sin no, having loved this present world, the world came in on Demas and led him astray. This man was once a fellow worker with Paul. And, you know, any one of us are, are liable to do that. Um, so sometimes we're on a wrong path. We're doing wrong things. We're, we're wasting time, whatever it might be. Humility enables me to hear that and to take it to heart. Humility enables me to accept apologies from my spouse and offer forgiveness freely. And this goes back, I was mentioning about forgiveness. And this one counselor who said that he has seen that to be the greatest problem leading to divorce in the marital counseling he has done. That shocked me. It really did. We always hear finances or whatever or immorality. But in his experience, this, this idea of not forgiving because what happens is, you know, it can be early on in marriage and things kind of get, they get swept under the rug and, you know, a young couple doesn't deal with things, but yet it's festering and the years go by and that little festering turns into a big boil and eventually comes out, angerness and bitter and all those kinds of things. And if we can talk to one another and, and apologize and that the apology is accepted, it's nothing worse than apologizing to somebody and they don't take it. They reject the apology. Well, what do you do? Where do you go? Uh, there's nothing else to do. So certainly as husbands and wives, right? We're not perfect people. 
we're going to make mistakes. Some of them a lot worse than others. Some of them have repercussions more than others. But the fact is we need to be willing to forgive one another and to accept apology if my spouse has wronged me. Humility will enable us to do that. It enables me to respond graciously when I'm right and my spouse is wrong. Right? You don't hammer that down to them. I think of these two verses that I have listed here. Galatians 6 and verse 1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. That certainly can have the idea of humility and being gentle, you know, and not beating them over the head. Paul says the same thing in 2 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 24, he says, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. So again, approaching um, areas when there's a right and there's a wrong, you know, we, we sincerely believe that. But it's that humble approach that can bring resolution. And we see that in these two passages. Humility enables me to look for ways that I can serve my spouse. And I really believe that humility is a prerequisite for service. Can we truly, really serve someone if we're not doing it out of a humble heart? I mean, if we're just serving out of duty, that eventually wears off and we just, we don't want to serve anymore. But if we truly are doing it with a humble heart, then we're doing it with our being. We're doing it with our heart and we're willing to serve. We want to serve. And, and what a, what better way to, to help a marriage than to look for ways that we can serve one another. In other words, I need to ask myself the question, what can I, how can I serve my wife? And she needs to ask herself, how can she serve me? Again, it's not about us, in our, ourselves. It's about the other. Well, that obviously, that works in the assembly too. How can we serve one another? So see, this is what I mean. These are principles that work in any relationships. And how much more will they work in a marital relationship? So humility. Maybe you can think of some other uh, ways or what humility enables me to do within the context of marriage. And uh, you can think through that. Okay, so here's our seven, what I consider fundamental, non-negotiable, foundational things, both in creation, thinking of men and women, and then in, in the marital relationship. We're created equal, men and women. Yet we differ in role and function by God's design. He's wired us differently, and that's fine. We can complement each other with that, or we can irritate each other with that. See, that's uh, we want to complement each other in these things. The institute of marriage is ordained by God. This isn't man's idea and all these principles. They're not man's ideas. Man is doing his thing, and we see what it's producing. Nothing, nothing good. God has the answer. We need to experience the beauty of being one flesh. It's a truth. We are. God says that. He makes the one flesh. But do we experience the reality? Do we live in the good of what that means? Thinking together, growing together, working together, serving together, all those kinds of things. We don't want to have unrealistic expectations of one another. Somewhere... Uh, along the line, you know, and I realize young couples get married and every, everything's bliss and the honeymoon and all the planning and, and everybody's running on adrenaline. Well, in a few years, that is no more. And now we're in the reality of life. And uh, so these expectations sometimes are kind of off the charts. We actually understand we're living with another sinful human being. Imagine that. <laughs> But God can help us. That's the beauty of it. God can help us. And then growing in the manifestation of the manifestation of the character of Christ. 
Okay, let's move on in this session then, thinking about now husbands and wives, and frankly, men and women. Again, this, this doesn't have to just be applied to the marital situation, uh, because really these verses are, are for men, they're verses for women. Now, some of them are specifically tied to marriage, but let's take a look. All right, qualities of a godly husband. Number one, he fulfills his headship responsibilities. And we've already talked about this. I don't want to spend a lot of time here. We've we've looked at these things that he was created first. He's, he, Adam was responsible. God held Adam responsible for sin coming into this world. And again, 1 Timothy 2 says, Adam sinned. Eve was deceived. So, you know, Adam was created first, and God gives him headship responsibility, and it is just that. It's responsibility. And so uh, we see that with the man and with the husband. Uh, the point there, the man is to rule his own house well, comes from 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4. It's interesting, later we read of the wife in Ephesians um, or First Timothy chapter five, that she is to manage the house well. The man is to rule; he's to lead, but the wife's given respons responsibility to manage. Right? It's hers to, I think, to make a to make a house a home. You know those kinds of things. That that womanly touch. She can make the home what it ought to be. She manages it, and yet he's responsible to lead. Those two things aren't in conflict. Those two things go together beautifully when done in the power of the Spirit of God. And of course, this last point, to be head does not mean dictatorship. And again, that's what our world, as soon as you say headship or the man leads, that's what's conjured up in people's minds, this idea of dictatorship. But rather, it's the idea of, of leading, of directing, um, leading spiritually giving the home spiritual direction, promoting the scriptures, knowing the scriptures, studying the scriptures, that, that may, he may be able to impart that to his, not only his wife, but his family. Praying, demonstrating a godly character. You know, going back to the last one, growing in, in the grace and the, the character of God, of the Lord Jesus. He's to be an example and the Lord Jesus said it very clearly that one who is leading should serve. That's part of leadership. It's what the Lord Jesus did. He said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life a ransom for many. That's the Lord Jesus talking, and that's what he did. He wasn't looking around for people to serve him. He was looking to whom he should serve, but he was a leader. And... Uh, you know, these things are very antithetical to what the world teaches and lives. Came upon this, this quote, which I thought was interesting, been pondering it. A man will fulfill his headship responsibilities to the degree that he submits to the headship of Christ. If a man's not willing to give Christ headship in his own life, chances are he's not going to be much of a leader himself. But if he sees the Lord Jesus and understands how he led and served and all that that means, what it means to lead in a, in a spiritual way, well, then, you know, we always go back to Christ, don't we? Always go back to the person of Christ to learn these things because he lived them out. So he, a godly man fulfills his headship responsibilities. He doesn't run from them. He doesn't shirk them. Um, he understands that's how, that's the position God put him in. So under God, we're responsible to be the heads of our homes and our families. And even again, broadening that out, leadership in the local church is for the men. A godly man loves his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for us. And of course, this puts us into Ephesians chapter 5. And notice three times in 
uh, verses 25 and 28 and 33. In each of those verses, we are told that a man is to love his wife. And we're to do that as Christ loved the church. And obviously, one of the ways that that means is to do that sacrificially. Because that was the love that the Lord Jesus demonstrated, a sacrificial love. I will sacrifice myself for the well-being of mankind. And that's exactly what he did. It's not an easy thing, is it? Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, we have to lay aside our own desires and so forth. But to do that sacrificially for our wives. I used to read this verse and kind of used to discourage me. Love my wife as Christ loved the church. And I'm thinking, well, how can I do that? I can't possibly love Michelle as Christ loved the church. But then it dawned on me somewhere along the line of studying and thinking about that. But I can always be growing. Right. I can be a better husband today than I was yesterday in my love for my wife. So I can be growing in it. I'm never going to be perfect. But if I'm growing, then that's a good thing. A godly husband, he desires that his wife is sanctified and cleansed with the word. Look at verses 20, 25, Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. A godly husband is concerned about the spiritual well-being of his wife, not just buying her all the things she wants, not just giving her a nice home and giving her all these material things that maybe she appreciates. But in the end, what's that have to do with our relationship? But when someone's growing in the word of God and becoming sanctified and growing in that, that is a wonderful thing. So he sees to it that she's well taught in the word. In 1 Corinthians eleven thirty five, 35, you remember what that verse says? If a woman has a question, let her ask her husband at home. <laughs> so husbands, we have work. <laughs> we have work to do, right? We need to be growing. Of course, we need to grow in these things. None of us are perfect. None of us have arrived. But this is the goal. This is the standard that God sets and gives to us as husbands. We ought to be able to answer our wives' questions. If not, we get in the book and we find them. He desires that she is holy, without spot, without wrinkle and blemish. That's what it says here. So, you know, we're concerned about our wives' holiness, her virtue, her purity, because these are things that are precious in the sight of God, not how well decked out she is. And again, all the material things we can give. Maybe they come, maybe they don't. But that's not the essence of a good marriage. He loves his wife as he loves his own body. That's verse 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. In other words, there's a, there can be a lot of time and effort going into maintaining my own body. I mean, in a physical sense, caring for my body, exercising, you know, a whole host of things. The point is that requires a lot of time and effort and so on. But that's the kind of thing the husband needs to apply to his wife. To give her the time, to give her the energy, to give her all those types of things, just as I do for my own well-being. We want to do that for our wives. Continue on. 1 Peter 3, 8. What a verse. In fact, let's turn there. I'll read it in its uh, entirety. 1 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> I'm sorry, that should be verse 7. Verse 7. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, that is your wives, with understanding giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. What a mandate for a husband. 
to dwell with his wife with understanding. And this kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier about realizing that we are put together differently by God, the man and the woman. So a man, at least myself and many men I have known, we're a little dense in this area. We, we need to, to understand our wives, how she thinks, how she feels, what she loves, what she doesn't love, know her struggles, her doubts, her worries. Um, you know, where's her fears? What's her needs? What's her joys? And those are the kinds of things we, we want to try to understand and, and help our relationship with one another. Very, very important. Uh, some versions say, dwell with your wife with understanding or with knowledge. Knowledge, understanding. So knowing them as a person, learning who they are. Well, obviously takes time, takes years. Uh, I mean, after 45 years, I, I can many times I know what she's thinking by looking at her face and her eyes. That doesn't always help me to how to know how to address it, but at least I know she's upset. I know something happened. I can just tell it by her eyes. Uh, you understand that if you've been married a while. Um, but then comes the second part, how we deal with that. But this sensitivity toward our wives, men, uh, that's mandate is given to us. Also, it says he gives his wife honor here. And again, that's verse seven. I'm sorry for the misprint there. Giving honor to the wife. You know, the idea of being considerate and respectful, thoughtful, kind. And then he says that the woman is the weaker vessel. What does that mean? In what way is a woman weaker? Intellectually? Well, not in our case. I can tell you that. How about emotionally? We might think women are weaker emotionally. Well, that's not necessarily true. They're deeper. Women are deeper than men. Doesn't mean they're weaker. In fact, I think they can teach us things about emotion. It's not that. You can go through all those scenarios, and I believe we really come back to the fact that a woman is weaker physically typically speaking. And so we just need to know that. We need to realize that. And we need to give honor to her. And we need to be thoughtful in that sense. Because we might tend to, you know, just, just, just keep on plowing ahead, thinking our wives are coming along, and maybe they can't. <laughs> so that's, you know, we can think through that, giving honor, because they are the weaker vessel. A godly man provides for his wife. Wife, First Timothy chapter five and verse eight says, "If a man doesn't do that, he's worse than an infidel. He's worse than an unbeliever. If anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever." I mean, that's strong language. So it is incumbent upon a man, particularly a husband, to provide for his wife. That is a God-given responsibility. Therefore, we shouldn't be lazy. But we shouldn't be a workaholic either, because that has other consequences. But we need to provide. Now, how much do we have to provide? Well, that's we need to work that out. What is really important in life? What all do we need to have? But we need to provide. Um, I know in the... Worked with young people already, I mean, teenage years, you know, college age and so forth. And, and again, you've, you've got men that don't seem to be going anywhere in life, like they're not preparing themselves in any way. They're kind of just wasting years. And here's these young ladies. I mean, they're looking for a relationship, but they're looking for somebody that's going to provide security. Shaking your head. That's <laughs> right. Women want that. It, God has built that into the woman. The man is supposed to provide that. Um, so, men, that's another thing that's a quality of a godly wife. We listen to that. He protects his wife. Think about this. Protect her from what? Well, protect her from spiritual and philosophical error. We talk about this a lot. You know, there's so much on the Internet I mean, young people can get on there. I mean, anybody get on there and just start running wild on the Internet. That's a dangerous place to be for error. So 
We need to protect our wives from that. We need to protect them from discouragement. In what way? It is hard to be a God-honoring Christian woman today. It just is. It's hard to be a homemaker. Because as I have here, it's viewed as demeaning to a woman. It's viewed as unfulfilling. It's viewed as stifling the woman's creativity and ability. And we're going to see a little later, that's, that's just not true. is isn't true at all. It's the world's perception of what the world wants a woman to be, how they define and how they want a woman to be. So we as husbands need to protect them from being discouraged if they are in the home and they are a godly woman and they're trying to live out the principles. Um, it's not easy in our world, but certainly we in the church ought to promote that and explain that it's virtuous and it's what God desires. We need to protect our reputation or character. We need to be careful how we talk about our wives. Again, I've, I've heard men talk about their wives in public. People here, and I'm thinking, I can't believe you just said that. Why, why would you say something like that about your wife for everybody to hear? Um, right? We want to protect their reputation, their character. We want to talk good about our wives. We don't want to put them in bad or compromising situations. So protecting his wife. And then to wrap this up, this part, qualities of a godly husband, we need to reaffirm the high calling of God's design for women. And men, we have a part in that. With our responsibilities, if we follow the responsibilities God has given us and we take that seriously, we are reaffirming the high calling of women. And we make it easier for our wives to be what they ought to be. So these are things to work towards. And, and again, principles. These are principles. Um, we take them. We think about them. We take them before the Lord. We, we confess where we're failing, where we need help. We ask the Lord for help. Help me with this. Help me to protect my wife. Help me to speak well of her. I mean, there are things we can do as the Lord gives us help along the way. So qualities of a godly husband, maybe you can think of some more, get your mind going. But these are, are some of the things. Now, let's look at the qualities of a godly wife. And this is where we'll, we'll end today. Qualities of a godly wife. Well, she's submissive to her husband. Okay, that's, it's stressed in scripture. And I believe it's stressed in scripture because God knew that it would be one of the most uh, thrown away principles that there is because it's not understood by people who reject God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a quote from 1971. I found this in my notes. I was just looking through my notes. Uh, I didn't do this in 1971. I think I did it in the 90s. But this quote was from 1971 from a feminist. Since marriage constitutes slavery for women, it is clear that the women's movement must concentrate on attacking this institution. Freedom for women cannot be won, he should not be there, without the abolition of marriage. That's 50 couple years ago. Look where we are. Is this the goal? It absolutely is. It's still the goal. Pushing, trying to... to rid society of what God has established, the marriage union, the, the, the basic, you know, the, the basic uh, social relationship of society, marriage and the family, because this is the way women view it, this idea of submission as slavery and all the rest. Well, number one, this is God's ideal. So how can it be a bad thing? That's number one. But you realize that submission isn't just a woman under a man. James 4, 7 says all believers are to submit to God. So we all are in a position of submission to God himself. Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, 5, it's supposed to submit to elders and to one another. 
Titus 3, 1, submit to rulers and authorities, every one of us, doesn't matter if we're a man or a woman, we have the mandate from God to submit to the authorities that are above us as long as they don't um, contradict plain teachings of Scripture. There's a speed limit sign out here. I'm to obey it. Many things that we are still able to obey because they are in authority over us. But 1 Corinthians 15, 28 talks about Christ submitting to the Father in a coming day. Let me just read that. 1 Corinthians 15 uh, it says here, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, and he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he, as he, for he has put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him. And then 1 Corinthians eleven three, 3, we read that earlier. The head of Christ is God. So this whole idea of being submissive obviously isn't a bad thing. It's not a demeaning thing. It's simply order and function of how God designed things to be. What submission does not mean, that a woman is inferior as a person, intellect, worth, that she is a slave, as that quote said, that she can never open her mouth or give thoughts. Um, the Lord help the husband who will not take the advice of his wife or listen to what she has to say. That's a foolish man, a very foolish man. So, you know, again, it's not the idea of not being able to talk, not being able to contribute, and so on and so forth. What is submission? That a woman is divinely placed under her husband's leadership. And there's a willingness, a willing submission. Now, it certainly helps when there's loving authority and loving headship. Those two go together and make the whole thing work beautifully. But it is a divine mandate. And her submission is unto the Lord, not just to her husband. It's unto the Lord. She embraces her God designed, her God designed for marriage and the family. And she allows her husband to lead. And there are times the man needs to make the final decision. After talk, after discussion, he is the one responsible. Men, we are responsible to make the decision. Now, hopefully we're in agreement. Sometimes maybe there's not that agreement, but we are responsible. Another quality of a godly wife is she understands inner beauty. Oh, our, our society is just so, <laughs> it's just so upside down and it's so wrong. Uh, everywhere we look, it's the outward beauty. It's youthfulness. It's all these things. And yet we read in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4, well, verse 3, 3 and 4, do not let your adornment, speaking to the women, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious. In the sight of God. Man, they are two powerful verses, aren't they? Inner beauty. Not just the outward adorning. Does he say you can outwardly adorn? It's not what he's saying. He's just saying that's not where real beauty lies. There's nothing wrong with being well arranged, which is the idea of the word. You don't have to walk out and be a mess, but be put together, be well arranged, and so forth. And cosmetics and hair and clothing. You know, that's not where it's at, but a gentle and a quiet spirit is precious in the Lord's sight. Here's a question. I kind of read this somewhere, too, so I didn't come up with this, but I thought it was a good question. Ladies, are you beautiful when the makeup comes off? I just thought that was thought provoking. Does that strip all the beauty away and then you're nothing? Well, that's what the world would tell us. You know, sometimes they have on the Internet, you know, these various... Um, Hollywood people 
what they look like with their makeup off. <laughs> you know, it's all physical. It's all outward. That's not what God says. Quality of a godly wife or a godly woman. This is for all women. It's in the understanding of inner beauty before the Lord. She values modesty. First Timothy chapter two and verse nine. You know, these are verses I'm not sure how much we meditate on them. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. Again, he's not saying you can't have that. But he goes on to say, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. She values modesty. Modesty. She's discreet. She's chaste. She's good. According to Titus 2 and verse 5, discreet, the idea of exercising wisdom, maybe knowing when to speak, when not to speak. Chaste, the idea of pure, dignified, honor. There's a there's character there. And good, uh, maybe morally pure. So here's a godly woman, discreet, chaste, good. She's trustworthy, according to Proverbs 31 and verse 11. Her husband trusts her. There is no substitute for trust. It can take years to build up, can be gone in an instant. Very, very fragile trait, but so important that we trust one another. It's a wonderful way to live, to be able to trust one another. She loves her husband, Titus 2.5. She respects her husband, Ephesians 5.33. She's concerned how she can please her husband in 1 Corinthians 7. I mean, that chapter talks about a lot of things. It talks about singleness. Singleness is a gift. If God has gifted you in singleness, then be single. If that's the way the Lord has led. But talks about um, a, a positive thing for being single. You don't have the concern of a husband, of a family. Um, But if you are married, you're a wife, then how can you please your husband? She loves her children. She's a keeper at home, meaning her home is her priority. Does this mean you can't work outside the home? No, it doesn't mean you can't work outside the home, but there is the priority of the home. And I mentioned earlier, she manages the home. She guides it. She takes care of it. Uh, I really, I like the analogy. She makes the house a home. Put a guy in a house and, well, he sleeps there, he eats there. Bring the woman into the house and she makes that thing a home. That's just who she is, what she does. And then we end with this, because I have no idea what time I started. I hope it's not been too long. But the Proverbs 31 woman, and I'm sure you know these. And here's just some principles from that, that great chapter. Um, Proverbs chapter 31, again, just some principles. She seeks the welfare of her husband. It says she does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Verse 23, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She speaks well of him. She takes care of her family. Verse 15, she also rises while it is yet night, provides food for her household. Verse 21, she's not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. Verse 27, she watches over the ways of her household, does not eat the bread of idleness. And right on the heels of that, she's a diligent, industrious woman. I won't read all the verses for time's sake. But this woman was busy. I mean, this woman was not sitting around. And she was doing things for people, for her family, and even outside the home, as is the next point here. She has interests outside of her home. Look at verse 16. She considers a field and buys it from her prophet. She plants a vineyard. She had some kind of interest outside the home. It's not wrong, but it needs to be in the right priority of the home. 
And verse 20 says she extends her hand to the poor. She reaches out her hands to the needy. So she did things outside of the home as well. Very industrious, very sensitive, very giving. That's who she is. Um, what a woman. She fears the Lord. Verse 30. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. She understood that. Much like our world doesn't. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. And then I will end with this. God will show grace to a godly mother. You know, raising children, that can take a lot of years. I mean, if you only have one, you've got at least 18 years or so in it for one child. And then, you know, if you got more, that's a lot of years. Pouring yourself into children. But God will show grace, at least in two ways. This proverb says, her children and husband will praise her. Verse 28, her children rise up and call her blessed. See, children don't realize it growing up, do they? <laughs> they can be very insensitive. But you know, when they get of an age, and especially when they have their own, they think back, wow, what mom did, you know? And there's praise there. But here's another interesting verse. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 15. It's a verse that has some different interpretations, but I believe this has to do, it says that the woman will be saved in childbearing. It's in the context of Adam and Eve sinning. For Adam was formed first, verse 13, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. I said, Adam bore the responsibility before God, but it's not good to be deceived either. And she bears that stigma. She was deceived. And I believe that's why verse 15 is here. Nevertheless, in view of the fact that she was deceived in the garden, God has something very precious for a woman. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness, and self-control. If the God... If God wills that a woman has children, she has the opportunity then, think about it, to affect that life to come to the Lord. Kind of the opposite of what Eve did, bringing sin and misery into this world. Now the woman has the privilege of bringing that life into the world and being of effect. And even if you're not a mother, you have the opportunity as a woman to deal with children and affect their hearts and give them the gospel. Just as we read about Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul says, I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. Timothy had a godly mother and a godly grandmother. Didn't seem to have a godly father at all. Didn't seem to have a believing father. So here's a home where you didn't even have a mother and father believing. And yet those two women poured the scriptures into Timothy. God saved his soul and used him mightily. We read over in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. Paul says that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation. And I believe this is God's way of showing grace to women, to mothers who have their own children, to women in general who work with children. The ability, because women just, again, they have a natural ability to work with little ones. Again, it's the way God has designed things. Much better at it than a man. And God has shown that grace to women. So qualities of a godly husband or man, qualities of a godly wife or women. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again for truth you have given to us. We are so thankful that we have your word we only wish we were more faithful with what you have given to us, the light you have given us, the ability with the Spirit of God within us to 
live according to these principles. Lord, help us. Help us to allow ourselves to be helped by you. Think of the area of humility. It's not an easy one because we are uh, proud by nature. Father, break that down in us, that we might be better men in general, but that we might be better husbands. We might be better women and wives. And Lord, help us to just contemplate these principles that you have given us and how to be godly men and women. Lord, show us how we need to apply that in our our own personal lives, whether it's in the context of marriage or whether it's in some other relationship uh, with one another in the body of Christ. Lord, this is your design. And help us, Lord, in living up to it. We do ask and pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.